Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me all right? Good. Thank you, Stuart, and for inviting me here today. Get situated here. Um, I guess you heard a little bit about what I do. I have a company called Reveal Growth Consultants, and we help our clients to find and capitalize on the best opportunities for innovation and growth in their market. Uh, to differentiate, innovate, and grow, to create a tight fit between what customers want and what the client organization actually delivers. And this increases success rates two to three times, and we do that through consulting, training, and mentoring. I'm going to be talking about how to generate breakthrough ideas for new and improved offerings. And typically, when you think about innovation, it has two primary risks. It has market risk, which is, will they buy it? And it has technology risk, which is, can we make it? I understand many of you also are very acutely aware of toxicity risk as well. But I wanted to ask you, how many of you know who your target customer is? Who's the person that's going to benefit or perhaps buy your work? Do, those of you who are clear about that, can I just see a show of hands? Okay. And I, I suppose if that's not clear, then it's not clear what exactly their problem is. But let me ask this question anyway. How many of you are clear about the problem that some people have? You're maybe not clear exactly who it is, but at least you're clear about the, the problem. And a lot of companies and people are not, so please don't feel embarrassed to... So a few of you. Okay. I would have thought um, being heavily focused on the science, that that side is where a lot of the risk is. I'm sure that's true. Uh, what I have found is the vast majority of companies struggle with what we call the market risk. Can't, will people buy it? Not can we make it? Um, well, let me start by asking some questions. Wouldn't it be fantastic if there were a systematic way to systematically drive innovation and growth? to create new and improved offerings that win, to create messaging and positioning that connects, to deliver customer or patient experiences that delight, to even create a culture where people are engaged, they're focused on the patient or customer, and they're regularly creating value. Wouldn't it be fantastic if there were a systematic way to do that? Well, actually, there is. That's what the jobs to be done approach is. Now, it's not a panacea. It's still a lot of hard work. There are limitations I'll address at the end. But it answers what is perhaps the most important question that any organization, any company must answer, and that is, what is value to the customer? And by answering that question, it enables organizations to systematically create value because they know what value is to the customer. So, my objectives this morning, I want to define the problems impeding the front end of innovation today. That's really my focus. I want to present the solution as I see it, jobs to be done, and we're going to have lots of discussion at the end, and I encourage people to stop me for clarification specifically as we go. And we'll have time for some application exercises and Q&A as well. Now, you know, jobs to be done, uh, let me ask this question. How many of you are familiar with jobs to be done? Have you ever heard of it before today? Just a couple of you, okay. Not surprised. Uh, while it's very new to many people, it's actually uh, an extension and the fulfillment of the marketing concept. If you've heard of the marketing concept, it's a marketing thing that I suppose scientists would never come across. But it's been around since 1952. And it simply states that the marketing concept is the philosophy that firms should analyze the needs of their customers and then make decisions to satisfy those needs better than the competition. Note the sequence here. First, analyze the needs. You're not surprised by this in medicine. First, diagnose the customer or the, the patient. While many companies have embraced this and say they believe this, up until the emergence of jobs to be done, it hasn't really been possible to fully execute. And that's why I say that jobs to be done helps companies to fulfill this, because it enables them to better analyze their customers and to make those decisions, how to satisfy those needs better, and to do it better than the competition better as well. 
Product failure, as I'm sure you know, in, in every industry is very common. I wanted to look at a number of different slices of the industrialized world, if you will. I'm sure you're not uh, unfamiliar with some of these statistics with drugs, but this is from a recent report, 2014, that about that under 12% of drugs entering clinical development are approved for marketing. Of course, those that even go into the marketing may not make it uh, in commercialization. And only 25% of venture-funded startups can pay back the initial investment. And this is interesting to me because this study looked at venture-funded startups that typically got at least a million dollars. You would think that that's they got that money because they had the best likelihood of succeeding, and yet 75% couldn't pay back that money. When you look at products, and this, this study looked at products that were put on the shelves in a large retailer, a big box store nationally, over 10 years, less than 40% of them, or about 40% of them were still on the shelf, but the total uh, success rate is even lower because a lot of new products never make that esteemed position of getting shelf space. So the number that he's looking at who got into the store and 40% succeeded three years later is certainly high as well. So you have startups, you have drugs, you have products. There's certainly a problem. Let's look at the state of innovation around the world. Uh, McKinsey did a study not too long ago, and they found that executives say that 84% consider innovation to be extremely important to growth strategy, and yet only 6% are satisfied with their innovation performance. It's a huge gap. Evidently, it's extremely important and very hard. And the third finding I wanted to share with you is that very few know how to improve the situation. Let's look at corporate R&D. It's underperforming. There's this company called Strategy and it's a PwC company. And they've been doing a study for the last 13 years. They look at the top 1,000 R&D spenders. Now this is all different kinds of corporations, certainly engineering and software and things different from biomedicine. But the, the point is, their findings have, have regularly been every year, they have shown there's no statistically significant relationship between financial performance and innovation spending. That's a stunning failure of allocation of resources. There is no correlation between financial performance and innovation spending. It's statistics like that that led uh, Clayton Christensen, as, as you heard earlier, who's one of the people that's really advanced this process to title his last book, um, Competing Against Luck, because it's still too much of a gamble. It's still a game of chance for too many companies. $700 billion was spent last year on this. So oh, I wanted to mention one other thing here. Um, of all the failures in new products, 90% of them, it's estimated by these authors that are pretty well known in, in uh, circles of entrepreneurship, that over 90% had this market risk as the point of failure. They couldn't get somebody to buy it, not that they couldn't build it. So in many markets, this is really the big problem. Let's talk about what innovation is. It's one of those words that we knock around, it gets bandied about as if we all understand it, and I guess for conversational purposes, that's true. But if you have responsibility to execute innovation, to create an innovation process, to create results, we need a much more precise definition. As a matter of fact, the whole problem with innovation today can be summarized by the imprecision of our language. I'm going to provide you with five clear definitions that will transform the effectiveness of any innovation process. We're going to start with innovation. Now, if you look at some, if you were to Google it, you'll find literally dozens, hundreds perhaps of, of different definitions. I pick three that I think are simple. Some of them are very long and complicated. And these also capture the two parts of innovation. So fresh thinking that creates value. Something different that has impact. 
the process of translating an idea or invention into a good or service that creates value or for which people will pay, customers will pay. Those are all very good, I think, but I prefer this definition. This is our definition because it's much more actionable. It doesn't just describe what innovation is. It shows us what to do to make it work. So we say innovation is a process of discovering target customers' unmet needs and then developing solutions to address them. Notice the sequencing, right in line with the marketing concept, with, patient, with doctors that diagnose the patient before creating the treatment plan. There are three things here that I want to point out. One is, it's a process. It's not an epiphany. It's not an inspiration. It's not an idea. It's not creativity. Processes have steps, and the sequencing matters. It's a process. And the sequencing of the two steps are first discover the target customer's unmet needs, and then develop the solution. Charles Kettering, if you know that name, he was the head of research at GM for years, very famous, held uh, 150 some patents, and he was the one that first coined a problem well defined as half solved. Perhaps you've heard that. And I like to say that a customer need well defined is half satisfied. Same concept. Now, Thomas Edison is famous for this quote, and a lot of people think that this justifies rapid prototyping, which is famous in design thinking and lean startup. And while these two processes have brought a lot of rigor, a lot of energy, a lot of thought, a lot of benefits to corporations, this is not what he was doing. He was not doing fast prototyping until he understood what the need was. He only experimented on solutions. He didn't do fast prototyping before he understood what the market need was. It's a very important distinction. Uh, Sarah Miller Caldicott, his great grandniece, who uh, unfortunately passed away last year, she wrote a book, Innovate Like Edison, and is a scholar on his approach, uh, tells a story about how at 22, he was up in Massachusetts visiting the state legislator, legislature. And he noticed how slow their vote tallying was. He thought, boy, this is really inefficient. I can create an electronic vote tallying machine that would make this very efficient. He went back to his labs. He created a prototype. He got a patent. He went back to Massachusetts and presented it to some of the people for reaction. And very quickly, he found they had absolutely no interest. Turns out they like taking their time so they can lobby their peers and influence the votes to come. That's part of the politicking process. Now think about that. With a simple question like, what would it do for you if you could tally these quickly without all that time spent in between people's votes? That one question would have revealed to him, this is not a good idea. But instead he went back and tried to get a prototype together and take it out there. The fact is, asking the right question is a much more efficient, much more revealing way to uncover customer needs. When you know what kind of information to get, it's prototyping, fast prototyping is a very blunt instrument compared to the precision of the process I'm going to show you. Now, there are lots of places in the world where we can see the importance of the sequencing. One I mentioned just a minute ago, and that is doctors. They always prescribe treatment after the diagnosis. It would be considered medical malpractice if they prescribed a treatment plan before doing the diagnosis. And yet, that's what companies are doing every day. They're putting out products without fully understanding the customer's needs. They're doing what Clayton Christensen calls marketing malpractice. And when you think about archers or sharpshooters, they regularly, they have a process that has three steps. Get ready, take aim, then fire. They don't get ready, fire, and then ask, did we hit anything? That's essentially what a lot of companies are doing. It's hard to hit a bullseye if you don't know where the target is. The target is the customer's unmet needs, and our solutions are the arrows. We need to be clear what the target is before we start creating those solutions and sending them out into the marketplace. Now, we know from study after study that the key to innovation and growth is having a clear understanding of customers' unmet needs. It increases success rates, profitability, and market share, and many other metrics. 
Problem is, a lot of people don't know what a customer need is. So let's talk about what a customer need really is, definition number two. This is a great quote. Maybe some of you have seen it from Theodore Levitt, the late, great Harvard Business School professor. He said, people don't want to buy a quarter-inch drill. They want a quarter-inch hole. Now, the reason this is so important is because it illustrates there's a clear, distinct difference between a customer need and a solution. The need is the hole to make a hole, the job to make a hole. And the solution, in this case, is a drill. There are always different options for solutions. It could be a punch, a pick, a laser, some yet to be invented tool. That's all the solution set, separate and distinct from the true need, which is to make a hole. Keeping this in mind, keeping this distinction in mind is what enables us to turn innovation into a systematic process because we can uncover the job to be done, totally independent of any solutions. And that's the kind of feedback we need to get from customers or patients or doctors, whoever your target customer is. Not their feedback on something that you're guessing might work. That's a later stage thing that will be much more effective after you know, like Edison, after you know what they want. So what the, the beauty of this is it can apply to virtually any industry. So let's take a look at a few here. Salesforce, they even have no software in their logo. That's because they understand people don't want to buy a CRM software system, they want to get jobs done, such as improve the quality of their customer data, manage the pipeline, their sales pipeline, increase customer retention. And GBQ, it's a local accounting firm, regional accounting firm here, client of mine. They understand that CEOs and CFOs don't want to buy accounting services. They want to get their financial and accounting tasks done, such as create financial statements, determine profitability, increase the accuracy of forecasting, et cetera. And an, an arterial line manufacturer that I worked with, they understood that nurses don't want to buy arterial lines. They want to monitor blood pressure continuously and take blood samples. Now, by focusing on the job that needs to get done, they're completely freed up to come up with a solution that may be breakthrough with a different delivery platform. This is a wonderful, a one other, this is for you and me, I wanted to leave, put this slide in here too. People don't want to buy your offerings or mine, they want to get their jobs done. And so our responsibility is to figure out what are those jobs that your customers are really trying to get done, independent of any product or service or technology. This is Clay, uh, Clayton Christensen, and uh, he makes a really important point. He and Tony Olwick, I should say, I learned this approach as, as I guess Stuart alluded to, uh, over my six and a half years with Stratagen. Stratagen Lecture introduced a lot of this thinking to Clayton Christensen at Harvard. Tony and, and Clayton did some work together about 20 years ago, and um, I'm very grateful to Tony for that six and a half years for a lot of the thinking that he's pioneered and I've been able to build on in my firm since 2012 as well. This is something that Tony always talked about as well, and Clayton um, has too. The job not the customer, is the fundamental unit of analysis for a marketer who hopes to develop products that customers will buy. So it's not understanding customers that is important. That's often a waste of time. If you've been involved with a lot of voice of the customer research, as have I, that's, the, that's uh, another method for uncovering customers' needs to then inform product development. And it's not unusual to get literally hundreds of pages of transcripts. And the boundary lines about what is relevant are extremely blurred. And anything could be relevant so it's captured to be tested. Unfortunately, it's a huge waste of time and it doesn't produce good results because they're trying to understand the customer, where they went to school, what kind of journals they read, now, it depends on what your objective is, but the primary unit of analysis should be what are they trying to get done in your domain where you have a competency to help them get it done better. So needs are really jobs that people, customers want to get done and the criteria they use for success. So the criteria are simply how they measure success, and I'll say some more about that in a few minutes. But people buy products and services to get jobs done. I, I guess I want to go back and just say I like this toolbox analogy because really that's what our goods and services are. Our goods and services are just tools 
to help them get something done. We're not enamored with a screwdriver because it's a screwdriver. We're enamored with a, a tool because it makes us much more effective in getting the stuff done that, that is important to us. So full, to, to flesh out the definition fully, it's an objective goal or task that people want to accomplish. I like the synonym task. It's very um, similar, but it doesn't carry some of what can be confusion around HR job issues. So sometimes I prefer when you're talking to people, I'm talking to people, it's more understandable to say the tasks people are trying to get done. But it can be a problem they want to avoid or resolve as well. And so the consequence, let's talk about what this means. That's sort of some background. What's this mean for innovation? Well, it means that the way to drive innovation with market insights, and that may be different from driving innovation with technology development. Technology development or scientific discovery, those are different ways to um, create breakthrough solutions. For science and technology to win in the marketplace, they're generally approaching well understood big problems where the need, like prostate cancer, is not to be questioned. It's understood. And if you can make some kind of uh, therapy, something to either prevent it or cure it or improve the condition, you know you're going to have a winning offering, as long as it's not toxic, right? Uh, that's not the case in a lot of industries. So the market insights are extremely important and for the adoption purposes, to really understand people's needs so that they want what you have. It's not enough that it just is a good solution. It'll remain latent value if they don't understand it and don't buy it. So what this means is for us, rather than focusing on improving or creating a great product or cure or treatment, whatever it may be, take our focus off of that and put it on what are the jobs that your customer's trying to get done and how can you help them get those jobs done better? And that will result in a superior offering. So there are three ways to look at this, three different focuses to uh, a market. Actually, two are market-oriented. The third is uh, another way to look at it. I'll get to that in just a minute. But it's how do you help your customer, your end customer, get a core job done better? How do you help them get more jobs done? And, uh, and I'll explain what these are in a minute here. just want to give you an overview. And how do you help them uh, have a great customer experience or patient experience? So the first two are looking at why people buy. People buy a drill because they want to make a hole. It gives you understanding about the predictable nature of what people are buying and why they're doing it. To have a great customer experience is what they have to go through. That's why you have all these five jobs down at the bottom there. There are numerous steps, just like the patient experience, there are numerous steps that they have to go through in order to receive the benefit of their medical care. That's exactly what we're talking about here. It's, if you're familiar with the patient journey or uh, service blueprinting, these are all different ways to, to make a visual representation of the steps, the job steps people have to go through. It's a very different focus here, and I'll show you in a minute. But as a mnemonic uh, device to remember this, I like to call it core, more, or adore. Core, job, or more jobs, or make sure they adore. Do what you can so that the service delivery is so excellent, they adore getting your solution and working with you. It's not just about, as you well know, uh, for example, the medical outcomes. If they have a bad experience, they may never come back to the hospital. So at this point, I want to take some time to debunk the false belief that I believe is the number one impediment to success. Uh, this is a key problem, so let's just address it and talk about it as much as we need to. And that is the customers cannot tell us what they want. This is so common, it's rarely questioned in any institution. How many of you have heard this? Have any of you heard this? Just to raise hands. Maybe you're not in circles of don't talk about it. Well, um, the reason that this is often, well, let, me, let me say it this way, based on this slide. People, when I talk to them, they'll often say, don't you know that famous Henry Ford quote? If I'd asked my customers what they needed, they'd have said a faster horse. Has anybody heard that quote before? And didn't you hear it in the context of, of course, customers can't tell us what they, need, what they need or want. Isn't that obvious? Haven't you heard that quote? That's the context in which this seems to always come up. But the problem is they're making a mistake. The question isn't, what do you want? The question is, what do you want to get done using a horse? 
question is, what do you want to get done? Now think about this. Had Ford gone out and talked to customers and said, what do you want to get done using a horse? It would have been very easy for them to respond. They want to travel from point A to point B. They want to transport goods. They want to plow a field. They want to enjoy outdoor recreation with friends and family. There are all kinds of jobs that people want to get done with horses. And they're readily available for the person who knows how to ask the right questions and understand them. You don't have to speculate in your garage and create something and hope it's addressing a need. Now, even Steve Jobs said that quote. You may know that he said things like this. People don't know what they want until you show it to them. That's why I never rely on market research. But he understood he was talking about the best solutions. You can't ask people for solutions. That's like the doctor asking the patient for the treatment plan. People are not material scientists or engineers. They generally don't know what the best solution is, and it's inappropriate to ask them. But just like the doctor asks, what brought you in here today? What are your symptoms? How long have you had them? He's a very good diagnostician, and that's what we have to be. Consider yourselves talking to customers, diagnosticians, so you can uncover what they want to get done, both functionally, I should say functionally, emotionally, and socially. And just about market research, he's right about things like jobs to be, or um, voice of the customer and traditional market research. The reason a lot of market research has been um, suffered in its reputation is because they didn't understand the difference between solutions and needs. What we're talking about today is totally different. It revolutionizes the way you can get information from customers. Now, he did understand, I just want to point this out, he, uh, the, um, he understood exactly what I'm talking about, as you can see from this quote. You've got to start with the customer experience and work back toward the technology, not the other way around. That's exactly what we're talking about. Start with the customer, what they're trying to get done, and work back to your solution. Now, some of the benefits. There are a lot of benefits. Let me just touch on the top three. First, customers can tell us what they want, as I just mentioned. That's a breakthrough in itself. This means you don't have to rely on observational research or empathy or rapid prototyping. Those are later stage things. Well, actually, observation and empathy are, are appropriate at this stage. Prototyping is a later stage thing. But the most powerful tool is, simple, is the simple tool of asking the right questions. And it frees us from the constraints of current solutions. And when you think about the job statement, make a whole, it's devoid of any solution language. It doesn't mention drills or any solution. That's what makes this a powerful approach. So you, if you are a drill manufacturer, and you know your customers are trying to make a whole, you can think about, well, laser technology is now becoming available. How can we help our customers make a whole better? What are the criteria for success that they use when they're making a whole? Can we use an entirely new technology to get the job done better for them? This is what leads to breakthrough ideas and innovation. <clears throat> and perhaps most important is this explains why people purchase. If you understand what your customers are trying to get done and how they measure success, and you can help them get that job done better, and you can once you understand that, uh, my, in my experience, 90% of the clients I work with have the internal resources to create a superior solution. So just like that statistic I showed you, their big concern, their big question, their big need is figuring out what exactly the customer needs and how they measure success, not making it. But we need to understand why they're buying. And if you can help them get that job done better, and you can, then you can be confident that your offering will be valued. That's predictive theory. That changes the game of innovation. Now let's get into our process reveal. This is based on jobs to be done, as Stuart said. I should mention that because I've been doing this for a while, uh, the last five years with Reveal, um, this is a process we've created. It's a little different from InnoSites. It's a lot more operational than InnoSites, in my opinion. And Stratagens has a different um, methodology as well. But they're all based on the insight that Customers buy products and services to get jobs done. That's the fundamental insight that we all share. Now, there are two parts to innovation, as I mentioned. I called it discovering the customer's unmet needs and then developing solutions to address them. 
Unmet needs are opportunities. So that's what I'm calling here, finding opportunities. There are two parts to it, and we're gonna look primarily at this left side today. And the three steps in this process that I wanna walk through and give you an opportunity to practice in your domain, whatever that is, are to select the innovation focus, and that's core more or a door, we'll come back to that. Discover the jobs to be done and their criteria. Determine which are opportunities, not all things that people are trying to get done, are opportunities for innovation. You'll see how that works in just a minute. Then once you have clarity about the opportunities, select those that are most attractive to you. Just because it's a big opportunity in the marketplace doesn't mean it's a good opportunity for you to address. There may be other competitors that are much better suited, so you don't want, you want to pass on some of those. And once you have gotten the best opportunities, you've culled it down to the best, most attractive opportunities for you, that's where great things happen, great strategy occurs. Now you want to do focused ideation, totally separate, totally different from traditional brainstorming. We'll talk about that briefly. And then you're ready to commercialize and uh, to develop and commercialize. So let's take a quick look at that. I put this slide in here just to show you the culling process, like a filter here. Once we capture all of the needs, we want to find which are important and unsatisfied, oops, sorry, and then choose even a subset of that that are most attractive. So let's talk about selecting the innovation uh, process, the, the focus. And there are three things, as I said, core, more, and a door. So help customers get a core job done better. And this is really important because uh, it's, we have to redefine the market. If, if I talk to a CEO of a company and they say we want to grow our core market or we want to grow this market, the first thing I need to find out from him is, well, who is your market? And typically he'll tell me it's this product line to these people. Uh, we've been taught to define markets according to products and historical revenue. So for example, we, it would be very common to hear somebody say the toothpaste market is a $2 billion market because a billion tubes were sold for $2 a piece. So it's a $2 billion market. Now that's great if you want to look backwards for accounting purposes, but it's not helpful if you need to look forward to determine what's the demand going to be for something that doesn't exist yet. That's the challenge of innovation, but we can do it. Jobs to be done now enables us to do it because we can redefine the market from the customer's point of view, which is who is this group of people that is our target customer and what is the job they're trying to get done? This enables us to get some sizing of the market and understand the demand for something that doesn't exist yet because it's not about the product. It's about how many people want to get that job done that's important to them that is currently not getting done to their satisfaction. So the key questions, and I'll be asking you to do this if it makes sense for you, and I'll give you another assignment if it doesn't. Uh, who are your target customers? What is the group of people that share a common job to be accomplished? And what's the core functional job they're trying to get done that you can help them get done better? So just to give you some examples of what this looks like, a redefined market from the customer's point of view has this structure. It's the customer group uh, and who wants to get a job done. So some examples, patients who want to find out what is wrong. It's a very common thing, every patient that comes to medical for medical care, they want to find out what is wrong. Obese people who want to establish a healthy weight. Nurses who take blood tests. Interventional cardiologists who want to open an artery. So this is what I'm talking about in terms of redefining the market according to a core job that your target customer is trying to get done. So I'd like to ask you to try it. You have the handout in front of you. Let's take two to three minutes um, to, to do this. If you have somebody next to you, please, and if you don't, please find somebody. I think it's much easier to talk about it with somebody than just sit there and stare at the page. So take two or three minutes each with somebody next to you. And uh, these are the two questions. Who are your target customers? What's the group of people that, want, that uh, share a common job? And what's that common job? And uh, our, is, let me just ask before I leave you for the two or three minutes. I want to make sure this makes sense for all of you. How many of you are wondering how to apply this to your world? Is it, is it obvious to, okay, there are a few of you that it's not readily obvious how to do this. For those of you who, who have that challenge, presume you're an entrepreneur and there's some business 
that you think is kind of cool than you're thinking of starting, separate from what you currently do. And try to apply it, just make it a lemonade stand, something simple if you want. Just for illustration purposes, find some example that's simple and easy to apply these questions. So any other questions about that? Okay, let's take two or three minutes each to answer these two questions. By the way, please record your answers on page three of the handout.
Okay, take about 30 seconds to wrap that up. Okay, can you bring your attention back to the room? Let's uh, bring it back up here, please. And uh, record your answer on the handout, page three. You'll see it says this is the map steps and the core functional job, page three of your handout, the customer and the job they're trying to get done, okay? So please record whatever you came up with on the handout, page three. Okay. Let me just ask before I move on, could you do it? Did it work? Was it possible? I see some nodding heads, but not a lot of hands. Was it frustrating? Did it not work for anybody? See, what else is there? I don't see a lot of hands. Okay, I guess I'll move on. Uh, the next one, I'm talking about core, more, and a door. So that was helping customers get a core job done. The next is helping customers get more jobs done. And again, this is a way to frame your market. So there's some uh, markets uh, that you'll want to define according to not just the target customer and, and a job, but according to a domain of jobs, an area of responsibility. Uh, so the key questions, and I'll show you some examples, who are your target customers and what's the group of people that share common jobs in an area of responsibility or domain? So area of responsibility is, is the most common. So I, for some of my clients, I can tell you for Microsoft, we looked at what do IT professionals want to get done in the course of their work? Anything that was highly important and unsatisfied was of interest to Microsoft. For Herman Miller, we wanted, they wanted to find out what are all the jobs that nurses in acute care settings are trying to get done because they're trying to create furniture and modules and equipment that helps them get their jobs done better. For GBQ accounting, that uh, accounting and consulting firm I mentioned here, uh, rather than help customers get a core job done like with assurance or tax planning, that's so um, competitive, they said we want to find other revenue streams. So let's find, else, let's find out what else CEOs and CFOs, for them, their marketers, CEOs and CFOs in mid-level, mid-sized, privately held companies, what are those folks trying to get done when it comes to financial and accounting related tasks? And again, those that are important and unsatisfied are opportunities. So in those situations, it's, a way, it's really an opportunity for new revenue growth. Core markets help companies to drive core market growth and helping companies Helping clients get more jobs done is a new revenue stream, new market growth strategy. Make sense? So uh, these are the two questions, similar but different. And here's some examples. Jobs, I guess I mentioned them, right, just a moment ago. Jobs that nurses are trying to get done in acute care settings. Jobs that physicians want to get done to manage a practice. Jobs that chemo patients want to get done that are now difficult to execute due to the side effects of chemotherapy. So you can see in this situation, it's sometimes, I would call the last one a domain. It's not an area of responsibility, but it's a domain. All those things that chemo patients are experiencing that used to be easier, that are important, and now are difficult. That could be a very ripe area of research to find that you, you will find big opportunities, just a matter of what solution to bring. And again, it's up to your creativity and capabilities at that point. You're not confined to a service or a pro. A, a product or a technology or a drug or anything. So, okay, take a minute and try this. Uh, again, if, it's, if it doesn't work for your current endeavors, take a simple example like a, yellow, like a lemonade stand, something where you can uh, try to understand this theory applied to some example. So here are the two questions. Let's take, again, two, three minutes each and record your answers on page four. So. Any questions about that? Okay, let's go ahead and do that with somebody next to you.
Would it be helpful if I gave another example? I see some, uh, some looks. Let me, take, let me take the lemonade stand example. If, you take, if you're talking about a core job, it's probably to get a refreshing drink on a hot day. But what are the other things that your customer who's out on a hot day might like to get done that you can do with that stand? So what are, what are some of the other jobs that that person, those people at Target Market, might want to accomplish that you can serve through at least your lemonade stand? Make sense? Okay, let's go ahead. Okay, take another 30 seconds to wind that up. Okay, if you can bring your attention back to the front of the room. What was that like? Any comments? or questions come up from that? Any comments or questions about how that went? Did it work for you? Were you able to do it? Good, okay. Yeah, that would be a great question. Anybody want to be bold and share an example? Anybody, it doesn't have to be great, just a lemonade stand. Yes, ma'am.
how to put that into the framework? Well, you're, 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 it's interesting. You have a good idea that that was some a headset, right? With some, yeah. some, um, some Alexa. 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 Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And this is usually the way it works, right? I mean, most of us come up with ideas, but it's interesting to note an idea presumes an insight. Innovation really begins with an insight. It's often wrong, but it presumes an insight that hey, I could do my tasks better if I had a headset with voice recognition and I could speak these things instead of trying to type them all out. That's a great insight. But it is helpful to figure out what is the job that you're most interested in getting. Can you tell us one core job in particular? You talked about documentation. Is that the core job to facilitate documentation, to quicken it, to get it done better? Yeah. So is your perception that a lot of nurses are frustrated by the time it takes to do the data entry on computers? Yes. Yes. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Great example. Yes. Are you really targeting those people or the people who are going to be paying for the cost? So Very important. Do you target market the administrators who have no clue about any of that? Thing? Yeah. And, uh, and, uh, Very good question. I, I, how does this fit into this whole stream? Because we know that people who are going to be using it, we identify the problem and the job they want to fill. Yes. These are not the people who are going to be paying it and, and actually at, at the end, you know, implement it. Yes. Yes, excellent question. I, this, I, I can count on this coming up because it's a very good question. No, no, I, I, but I'm, I'm just going to deal with it right now because it, 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 I just wait till it comes up. There are always numerous customers, some more important than others. There, usually there's a value chain and there's an ecosystem, an ecosystem of customers. For example, a lot of the clients I work with have in, in medical, there's a physician, there's an anesthesiologist, there's a nurse. These different people, when it comes to a surgical procedure, are all involved, and it, they need to be taken into account what they're trying to get done for that company that's trying to innovate. And they're often not the people that purchase the medical devices, as you're alluding to. It's the end, we always recommend that the end user and what is valued to them be number one. That's where to start. So if it's nurses that have the frustration, start with understanding how to alleviate that frustration because the whole market is driven by serving them. The administrator only buys those things because he's heard nurses complain and he realizes there's a productivity problem, there's a morale problem, whatever the consequences are. He gets it, she gets it, and now they're what, willing to put out the money to buy this new software solution, whatever it is. But you, you have to go to the purchasing agent and understand what are their criteria. So that's, that's part of the next approach I'll show you, which is understanding the different things that people are trying to get done that are around that uh, core customer and customer. Did I see another question, sir? Another piece of that? No, I'm sorry, but I, 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 at least it doesn't seem like the administration uh, works that way. I don't think they, they see the frustration of nurses and doctors and then they buy the product. Apparently, they, they buy the product to do the billing because it's, it's enforced on them by regulation. Oh. And then Okay, this is part of the regulations, yeah. <clears throat> well, that's, that's, a, that's a market anomaly. Maybe, I mean, it's obviously a big deal in healthcare, and I appreciate you saying that. That's the reality. Um, typically, you know, where there's a freer market that regulations aren't imposing those, those things, um, you know, pe companies are driven to be more productive. That's part of what makes capitalism so effective. But uh, when there are regulations involved, that's a whole other can of worms that I can't really address. So you have to figure out how to change the regulation or get around it somehow. But it, obviously it would be in the interest of the hospital to have a, an administrator, a purchasing agent, 
who understands the frustrations and quickly is sensitive and gets those things into the hands of the people that do the work. All right, I'm gonna keep moving on here. Good, good conversation, thank you. And again, please document uh, anything you could. I guess I wanted to come back and try to take a stab at how to fit your response. This is important to try to take a stab at it, how it would fit into this, this um, drill here. You described a core job. That's a good start. And an another way to look at this is it, every company, every entrepreneur must start their investigation with some understanding of their competency and what domain they feel they can compete. It's not, we're not all good at everything. There are certain scientific skills, nursing skills, or whatever. You know, people and companies have unique strengths that they want to leverage to create value. So we need to define what's inbounds and out-of-bounds here. It's not uh, like, like Herman Miller, because they're making furniture, they wanted to know everything that nurses are trying to be trying to do in their job. And they threw out about half of them because they would best be served with things like software solutions or other kinds of platforms, not furniture platforms. And they recognize that's not what we do. It's interesting that that's something that we see, but it's not an opportunity for us. So they culled the list down about 50% to what is a furniture related kind of thing. And so you have to presume, if let's say you are presuming a software solution competency, if you were just for illustration, that's usually you have to come in with what is the area here. If you see the problem and you know the problem, the, to find out what are the other kinds of jobs, what's the domain, it might be what are all the jobs that um, nurses and doctors, whoever has to document, what are all the things related to documentation? What are all the related jobs they're trying to get done? There are probably a lot that are just called documentation but what are all the frustrations and things that go into meeting this regulation, for example? So it's a broader, you want to understand the full scope of this frustration and, and what jobs people are trying to get done so that you can address them as well. I think that's the best answer I can, I can give now. Let's keep going here. We have until basically quarter of, is that right? Okay, well, the, the last one here, and then we'll I'll whiz through to the end pretty much. This is the, so it's core, more, and adore. This is a customer experience or patient experience innovation strategy. And what we're trying to do is help them to get the job done of acquiring your value better. So the, the questions here are, again, same target market. Now, this is a little different than the other two, which are getting out why people buy. They want to buy your offering to get jobs or a job done better. Here, we're presuming, we're presuming you know what the job is. You, it's like uh, you can't, you, you, when somebody comes to the hospital and they're, you're trying to improve the patient experience, you have to know what they're there to get if you're going to improve that patient experience. Like for there for um, chemotherapy, then you need to look at all the steps that they go through when getting chemotherapy. So in the other cases, we're not presuming a solution, but in this case, we're looking at the, the particular solution and how they acquire it. Uh, another way to look at this is, well, I mentioned it earlier on. This is not why people come to the hospital. They come to the hospital for treatment for their cancer, oncology, let's just, for uh, chemotherapy, let's just say. That's what brought them here, that medical need. But you want to provide the best patient experience you can. So it's really important you understand what different job steps they have to navigate in order to receive the benefit of your chemotherapy. Follow me? So that's what we're looking at here. Um, and I'm going to skip over the example because just to, to, for time purposes, we're going to skip over the uh, application exercise, I should say. Here's some examples. So hospital committees purchasing peripheral IV catheters. So this was a, um, a peripheral IV catheter manufacturer I worked for, and they wanted to know, they, they're international, how are hospitals making these decisions? They're, it was opaque to them. They couldn't figure it out. So I went and talked to these committees, purchasing agents, to find out what the different job steps they go through to make that final decision. That's part of, for this client, this third strategy 
of uh, the experience. Cancer patients receiving chemotherapy, I just mentioned that. Patients obtaining medical services. Families visiting an, an admitted patient. You can look at the, let's take a look here. Here's a, here's a map of uh, the patient obtaining medical services. And it starts with, you can't read it very well, it's schedule an appointment, access the provider, explain the problem, obtain a diagnosis, evaluate the treatment options. These are job statements. These are not services being delivered. There's no mention of the service typically in these statements. Just like the job statements, these are job statements. If you're familiar with journey, customer journey mapping or service blueprinting, those are some other visual displays that break services down into steps. But the, the focus and the objective is very different here. In, in customer journey mapping and service blueprinting, People are trying to document the service interactions, what we're, the service encounters. What we're doing here is we're getting at the purpose behind the encounters. Just like people don't want to buy a drill, they want a quarter inch hole. What's the reason for this step? So we want to capture, it doesn't say call for an appointment, it says schedule an appointment. Um, for working with a medical firm, talking to anesthesiologists, I remember a good example he said, what are you trying to do at this point in a surgery? And the anesthesiologist said, I want to, I check the monitor for the person's heart rate. And so it would be very natural to put check the monitor for the heart rate. It's a bad job statement because it includes the current solution, which is the monitor. What he's really trying to do is to assess or determine the patient's heart rate. It has nothing to do with the monitor. So these steps should be devoid of any solution language as well. So you get at what's the purpose behind the encounters. I'm going to keep going here because of time. Um, and you can do these on your own. And I just want to mention, if you can identify talking to customers, now it's great to, to come up with whatever you think you know, but obviously this has to come from customers. And that's, maybe it's not so obvious. A lot of companies make the big mistake of sitting in a boardroom thinking that, hey, I talked to Joe in sales, and I think these are the first three steps. Okay, it's a great way to start, like a prototype, and then go out and talk to customers. But, and you can ask them, what are those, how do you start this whole job? But it really has to be generated and validated by your target customer. Okay. I should be wrapping up in about five minutes. Is that right, Stuart? Oh, good. Okay, good. I, thought, I was wondering why I was so far behind. <laughs> I'm glad I asked. Woo, that's good. I was going to skip a bunch of slides there. Um, Step two here, identify the job steps. So this is, this is looking at what are those job steps. So this is step two. We've, we've selected either core, more, or a door as our uh, innovation focus. And now we're going to discover the customer's jobs to be done and their criteria. And the way that we really would just, I showed you this. This is, before we were just really trying to establish whether it's core, more, and a door, and now we're actually in the process here, you would go out and talk to customers, some internal people yourself to get it started, to get some ideas so your head is in the game from the customer's point of view before you go out there. So that's the beauty of this approach. It's looking at everything from their point of view. It enables us to step into their experience and look at the entire experience and outcome of working with you and getting your value from their point of view. So these are the three things. This is these three uh, worksheets you have in your handout, so you can try this um, in your time should you want to. If you can identify these things, and you can talk to five potential customers, you will be amazed at how robust your information is when you're asking the right questions. It's extremely powerful, and you can ask them what when you're executing this job, be it uh, an experience job or it's a core job for the jobs, it's for when it's a jobs map, it's an inventory. This is an inventory of more jobs done. For a core job or the job of acquiring a service, it's a stepped process. And uh, if you can get these steps down and talk to clients, customers about which, where in this process do you find it challenging or slow uh, or difficult, you will be amazed at the opportunities that emerge. So there are three types of jobs. I mentioned functional, emotional, and social. Here's an example of, of what that might look like for nurses in acute care settings. 
conduct, this is the functional job, conduct a physical assessment of a patient. And the emotional job is to feel confident the patient's needs are being met. And the social job is to, to be perceived as caring. So all three of these are important because it gives a holistic view of what's going on uh, for your target customer. In this case, the nurse is, is the target customer. And we want to capture criteria. And I'm not going to get into this too much, but on each of the steps in the core job or the, the map of the experience, they're going to be at criteria, typically these five, speed, variability, effort, effectiveness, and efficiency, that they will mention. If you, you can ask questions like, what makes this step slow or time consuming? What makes it go off track? So that's a variability question. These questions are very helpful for every step. So you can determine what are the criteria for success at this step. And it's probably going to be around one of these five metrics. So for example, with the diagnosis in this example, um, we know that some of the criteria are to minimize the amount of time spent waiting for a diagnosis, increase the likelihood that the provider explains the diagnosis in a way that's easy to understand, minimize the likelihood that the diagnosis is wrong. Those are some pretty common uh, metrics, criteria, when executing the step of obtaining a diagnosis. So okay, going on to the next one. Now we're going to determine which are opportunities. And there are a number of ways to do this. But just as a visual here, here are all the different jobs to be done, or criteria. It could be criteria within a job. The trick is, which are important and unsatisfied? Not every job is an opportunity. We want to know which are the highly important unsatisfied needs. And this process can do that for you, just like this visual display shows. The yellow are the opportunities. They're unmet needs, highly important and unsatisfied. The more unmet, less satisfied, the greater the opportunity for innovation and growth. Now, there are a number of ways to do this. Um, the best way, if you want really, if you want statistically valid uh, results with the most rigor, is to put the statements, the job statements or criteria, into a survey, deploy to your sample, to a representative sample of your target population, and have them rank every one of these jobs for how important is it to you to get this job done on a Likert scale, one to five, and then how satisfied are you with your current ability to get it done? Likert scale, one to five. Highly important, unsatisfied. Bottom right quadrant is where the opportunities are. That's what you want to find. Now, a lot of companies that don't go through this thinking, and you don't have to do it with this. You can do this with the questions qualitatively. You don't need a statistically valid survey. You can ask questions, as I've done with numerous clients, through the qualitative interviews alone, you can simply start off the interview by saying, I'd like to talk to you about those tasks, like for GBQ, good example, talking to those CFOs, CEOs. I'd like to talk to you today about all the financial and accounting related tasks you're trying to get done that are really important, but not getting done to your satisfaction. So you're framing the conversation into the bottom right quadrant immediately. Yeah, and I actually tell them, I know there are a lot of petty things that we could consume our entire hour on, let's not do that. I'm only interested in the really important, unsatisfied things that you're trying to get done. So what comes to mind? And then we start the conversation. A lot of companies that don't go through this thinking are wasting their time on things that are unimportant to the customer. What a waste of allocation. What a wasted uh, misallocation of resources. What a waste of time. And on the top right, highly satisfied, highly important, those are often not opportunities because they're already well satisfied. Think about going to your favorite restaurant. You get a six-course dinner, let's say. You just had an incredible big meal, a delicious dessert, and then the waiter comes out and says, on the house, we'd like to give you the chocolate death cake as well tonight. Well, I'm already full. I'm in the top right quadrant. I can't have more delight. I can't have more satisfaction there. It's the only place to get delight, customer delight, to delight customers and create value is with highly unsatisfied needs or as jobs and criteria. OK, so that's how we determine which are opportunities. Now, as I said earlier, that's only half this thing. That's the find opportunities. That's the market side. Now we're bringing it in-house, develop solutions. Now we need to determine which of these, let's say, 50, 100 different jobs or criteria are actually 
attractive to us given our capabilities. Like I mentioned Herman Miller, 50% of them were not furniture related solutions, were not furniture related uh, opportunities. So the common criteria, for example, in evaluating these, we'll go through is, is this opportunity within our strategic fit? Out, you know, what's inbounds, what's out of bounds? Is it, do we have a competitive advantage if we were to pursue this? Is there a big revenue potential if we were to win this, et cetera? There are about five, six, seven common variables. Typically, there, every company has that's in a commercial environment. Okay, now we've got that down. We've, we've uncovered all the jobs. We've determined which are important and satisfied or opportunities. We've determined which are valuable or uh, attractive for us to pursue. Now we can take it into what we call focused idea generation. Very different from traditional brainstorming because now we have great clarity about a few areas of great promise. Unlike brainstorming, that tends to be a guessing game and find out later if it really meets a compelling unmet need. This is where design thinking can add a lot of benefit. All of this other work precedes what goes on in design thinking and, st and lean startup. So the beauty of this is the team agrees on what unmet needs to target for value creation. In this process, there really is such a thing as a bad idea. If an idea does not address one of the selected top opportunities, it's a bad idea. Why waste your time? We want to accelerate what we're doing and get right to the point, the big, highly, highly important unsatisfied needs. And it establishes, this is a way to engineer a valued and unique position in the marketplace. And I can say that with confidence even before we know what the solution is. Because we know if you are targeting a highly important opportunity and you can create a solution that helps them get that job done better, it will be valued. They say it's important. If you can help them get it done better, it will be valued. And we can say it's going to be unique because if you're targeting a highly important unsatisfied opportunity, that means the market isn't doing it. And if you do satisfy it, your solution will be valued and unique. That's what good strategy is. That's an amazing predictive capability without even talking about the particulars of your solution. And oops, downstream, I, this is an important point. This is usually referred to, jobs to be done is usually referred to as an innovation approach, which it definitely is, but that really inappropriately narrows what it is and what it can do. We're talking about how to define what customers value. And every part of the business that's customer facing, value creating, is enhanced and becomes more effective when people know what customers value. So I'm talking about messaging and positioning, you know, in the communications, I'm talking about generating ideas, of course, talking about sales, talking about conducting competitive analysis, all of these things that are customer-facing value creation activities are significantly enhanced. And then we come to develop and commercialize because now you have a concept, typically what comes out when we're doing this, I wanted to give you the full array and leave you with some um, condensed version. I'm giving you the full thing so you can see the power of this approach and then give you a condensed version that you can apply more uh, easily to your situation. But now, out of the step five, we typically have concept boards that document the best ideas addressing big opportunities, and they're ready to go into development, and you don't have to do uh, validation of the, of the opportunity. And this is where Edison would start with his fast failing. Fast failing is great after you've identified the unmet need. Think about it. You know, Lead Startup loves to talk about, if you're not familiar with it, I'll just tell you it's a process that talks about bringing science to entrepreneurship. But in fact, the, they're conflating two different experiments. The experiment of, is my idea of the customer's need accurate? And the test of, is my solution effective? Good science does not conflate experiments. We must do one at a time. Edison did bring science to entrepreneurship because he first discovered what people wanted, and then he did fast failing, 10,000 failures in the solution space to create a solution that was effective at addressing the already discovered well-known need. Follow the distinction? Very important. So what's this do for us? Well, this is how you can engineer a tight product market fit. This is a great definition of success in many 
for many startups or new products. And when it comes to some of the other processes, like StageGate, is anybody familiar with StageGate, new product development process? Okay, you may know that it starts, it's, in a lot of communities, innovation begins with a good idea, and that's true with StageGate. Uh, this is typically the way it looks. So the ideas are generated with presumed insights. Uh, people see things and they say, hey, I have a good idea. So it makes sense in our day-to-day -day world that this is where it would start. But as I said, in reality, ideas are generated because of insight and some new way to apply resources to get something done. So it really begins with insight. So we want to start uh, we want to start with the jobs to be done process first. Discover the clients, the customers, jobs to be done. Determine which opportunities to pursue. Conduct that focused idea generation. And then go into filtering. So we're starting much earlier. The, this process has all this upfront work before the typical idea generation. Then you can go into the regular stage, uh, stage gate process. And you'll see prototyping at stage three. That's not the first thing or second thing. It's the third thing. If you want to make innovation a predictable business process, if you want to keep it a guessing game, go ahead and start with prototyping. Now, so one of this, this is a nice quote, StageGate helps companies develop products right, but jobs we done helps them develop the right products. And here's the lean startup validated learning cycle for not familiar with it. It starts with ideas goes through what they call a minimum viable product. It's basically a, an essential prototype to get feedback. But again, this is trying to uncover customer needs. That's a blunt instrument. It's not nearly as effective as just simply asking the right questions. So we can do that up front and not waste the time of resources like Edison did trying to prototype something when you don't need to. Prototyping is great once you have that need understood. Same with design thinking. Again, these two processes have delivered a lot of value. There's a lot to love about them. They're both highly focused on the needs of the customer. Human-centered design is what uh, design thinking is all about. These are excellent, noble things and, per and uh, processes. The problem is they have been victim to the same false belief I mentioned up front. The customers cannot tell us what they want. We need to separate what they want as solutions from what they want as jobs be done. And then we find they can indeed tell us what they want. Now, this is uh, an interesting quote from a former client at Microsoft and then NetJets, now he's at Valvoline. And uh, I, this was just too good. I, he, uh, I interviewed him for an, uh, an article I wrote and I thought, boy, this is a good comment. I, I was impressed with it, my, even though I've been doing this for 11 years. I've participated in probably over 100 jobs to be done projects over the years and I've seen, and I've yet to see a case where it fails to deliver. I've seen teams fail to capitalize on the insights that jobs we'd uncovered, but I've never seen the approach itself fail to uncover insights that pointed to potentially game-changing new product service concepts. And this is um, one of, this is from Competing Against Luck, Clay to Christians and, and uh, his colleagues, one of his colleagues, I forget the name, works at Nielsen. Uh, so they did this research and found that in uh, between 2012 and 2016, their, their annual breakthrough innovation report tracked over 20,000 new product launches and identified that only 92 had sold more than 50 million in year one and sustained that in year two. And on the surface, it looked like they were, the winners were just random businesses, very different businesses, but the one thing they had in common, every, common, every single one of them nailed a poorly performing job to be done. That's a pretty compelling statement that there must be some great value in nailing the job to be done. Um, this is a course example. This is a case, this is a, uh, case study that my former employer, it's in public domain, Strategion did that I wanted to share with you. This used to be Cordis. It was Cordis, then J&J &J bought them, and now, of course, you may know Cardinal Health owns them. And in the research, talking to interventionist, interventional cardiologists, we found that they wanted to open an artery, and one of the, that was the job to be done. And we found that minimizing restenosis, which is the reoccurrence of the blockage, was a big problem. And actually, they knew this. I mean, the, the Cordis knew this from just casual conversations with cardiologists all the time, but they didn't understand how big until we went through the quantitative surveys and saw the very high importance scores and the very low satisfaction scores. So it turned uh, this, they were first to market. They, they took what was number 19 in their pipeline, this, this solution to, to 
uh, minimize restenosis. They moved it up to number one once this research was done and were first to market with the stent, which became the fastest growing medical device over a billion dollar in uh, two years. Now, I want to come back to this claim I made earlier that this approach increases new product success rates two to three times. Um, I'm saying that based on the two of the studies I showed you up front, the 25% of startups that are funded, only 25% can pay back their investment, and the 40%, which is actually a very high or conservative number of new product failures. So that's the low end, and a study that my former employer, Strategion, did, in which they hired an independent researcher to do a random study of uh, the clients and all the projects that we had done. That's back in 2010 when I was there to find out what percentage of those projects were actually successful in the marketplace. And the, the results were 43 people, clients were interviewed, 49 um, projects, products and services entered into development, 28 were um, in process, 21 were launched, and 18 were successful. So 18 over 21 is 86% success rate. Now, not a huge sample for sure, but still a very significant finding. It's hard to get numbers on some of this stuff. So we're all very proud of that. And I think for my company, even though that's the study they're doing, um, I think it's a good proxy for what our clients achieve as well, as long as we're doing the qualitative reviews ourselves, as well as the statistical surveys. Those add a lot of precision and clarity. So one other thing I wanted to show you, and then we can open it up for uh, questions, comments. I think it's important to be fair about the limitations and the challenges of this approach. And there's some that are worth mentioning. Um, first, it's very different, if you haven't noticed. Now, maybe because you're not in these circles, uh, you wouldn't know. This is very different from what people hear when they're in design thinking or lean startup circles. So there's an immediate question, like what? It's just the whole gestalt is quite different from what we have heard um, in those other very popular, very effective in many ways approaches. Um, but this pro approach complements and precedes design thinking and lean startup. But it's so different, that's certainly a hurdle. There's an educational process for people to understand. Framing projects, like we were trying to do about more core and adore, how to really understand what part of the market to go after, what inputs to capture, that's really the key skill here. You must understand what inputs from customers you want to capture that will guide you in your development, in your idea generation and development. These are not difficult, these are uh, not easy things. They're, they take some skill. It's not as simple as just getting in a room and coming up with ideas or putting a prototype out. I mean, there are reasons that lean startup and design thinking are, have, been adapted, have been adopted so quickly. People can do them and get some good results quickly. This is harder to do. And it minimizes market risk. I was talking about market risk versus technology risk. This is focused entirely on market risk, and it will minimize market risk very significantly, as you can see. But it doesn't directly address technological risk. That is, can we make it? But as I said to you, 90% of my clients don't have any problem with it. Simply knowing what customers value and how they measure success, how they measure it, is the key. And they can rally their own internal resources to create a superior offering with that information alone. And I should also say that knowing the true needs of the customer informs the technology, right? Isn't that what a doctor is doing when he does a diagnosis? When, he, when the patient shows up, he's not clear, am I gonna pre prescribe some drugs? Do I need to do some kind of intervention? Is this gonna be a surgery? I mean, unless he has some preceding knowledge, he's gonna have to wait and let the diagnosis reveal to him what the right treatment plan is, what the right delivery of that care will be. Same thing here. So even though we're not directly addressing the technology risk, we're reducing the technology risk very significantly. That's why that number was 86% successful in the marketplace, because you're informed now when you go into the technology development. OK, let's take some, let's take some questions or comments, take a deep breath, and uh, see what questions you may have. Any thoughts, comments? Questions. Does this make sense? Does 
step right up. Questions are welcome. Confusion, questions, comments, concerns, likes. Now, what's going on here? Pretty quiet this morning. What is, what's up here? Did, have I dumbfounded you? Or are you left going, hmm? Well, as I said before, I'm a nurse, and so I'm at the um, user end of a lot of what you're talking about. And for years, I've seen things handed to me or given to me to use with my work. And I look at it and I say, nobody ever asked the nurse how, why we are doing this or what this is good for or why to even put it where they put it. And I'm so thankful to hear um, your process and that it's putting the end user or the customer um, first. Yes, good. Thank you. You're welcome. Glad to hear that. Yeah, actually, this is, I, I'm not talking about the culture of innovation, but there are direct applications. I, I mentioned in my start that what if you could create a culture where people are engaged and they're focused on the customer and they're regularly creating value when everybody knows what your patient or customer considers value, how they measure value, it's engaging. It helps increase motivation because, you know, the people often don't realize, I didn't know, I was actually going to be a psychologist, but I found a way to help people do, and through basically a behavioral change program uh, to change their behavior and reduce the incidence of smoking dramatically in Philadelphia. And I recognized, I got into business to actually deliver this program. And I recognized the noble purpose of business is to create value for a customer. I was thinking business didn't have that kind of noble purpose. Healthcare has that kind of noble purpose. That's certainly true. But business has a noble purpose too, helping customers get the value they need, whether it's nurses or other people. So figuring out what it is they're trying to get done and delivering it to them is a wonderful thing. Yes, ma'am. Um, so I guess my question is, how do you deal with competing interest? So a customer wants a cell phone battery that will last them forever. But on the flip side, companies that are making cell phones don't want your product to last forever because they want you to buy the next round of cell phones. So how do you build in competing end user customer interest? Great question. That is a very real challenge for companies every day, those trade-offs. And I, first I would say, Typically, I don't get into that. The front end of innovation is I hand it off when we have the concepts generated in concept boards, and then it goes into stage gate, and they have to figure that out. So I, I have to confess, I don't deal with that very often. However, we can find out, just like from the same process, we can find out which of these needs of the customer population is greatest. So if there's a trade-off, you can have a mathematical representation of how big the market that cares about the battery is and how big a deal it is to them versus um, the other option, whatever that is. The thing that's, that I guess you're saying the company's priority to not uh, give up the opportunity of repeat sales. These are trade-offs with full information. The more information, the better informed the decision makers will be. And I guess the, the way that this might apply is simply giving the information to that decision maker, that team, about how big a deal is this? We can actually size that market and size the, the bigness of that concern in the marketplace to decide, do we want to address it or not? Any other thoughts, comments? Um, my name is Mu Yang Hu. I'm from Rev1 Ventures. And thank you so much for your time talking about the jobs to be done and the ways to approach your end user and customers. That's exactly the approach that Rev1 actually helped the entrepreneurs to use as well. So given the fact that audience we have today, a lot of products, the end user or buyer are actually medical related um, service providers. So um, one challenge we have been facing is how we can approach those target audience. What are the ways that can actually help them to easily have the access to these target audiences. Because comparing to the uh, software companies, 
um, the consumer market is really much easier to tag along, right? So what are the ways that in your experience that you have been using and it's been very effective to approach those um, end users? So I'm sorry, I may have missed something in the beginning. Say, tell me again who the end user is. So um, I'm just speaking for the general crowd here. So yeah. I'm assuming a lot of end users are doctors, pathologists, or yes. um, um, pediatric, um, I don't know, practitioners. Okay. So those are very specific, right, um, end users. Yes. So how can you reach them while you're developing your product? Because you need their feedback. Yes. And so is it, is it a question of the difficulty to get in to talk to them? Is that what you're referring to? The, the challenge of actually getting in front of them? Is that what you're referring to? That's the challenge you were facing. And what are the ways that, in your experience, yeah. work effectively to approach yeah. those audiences? Well, you may not like the answer because it's expensive. When I'm dealing with corporations, they're willing to pay those doctors handsomely to sit down for 45 minutes. Um, because they're not in the business of giving up their time freely. They're extremely busy, as you know. And that's true for CEOs or lawyers or you know, high-skilled, high-paid individuals typically are not going to do volunteer you know, surveys or interviews. So it does require, it can be a few hundred dollars for 45 minutes for some people. Um, that's typically, I'm usually working with corporate enterprises, so they know that that's just part of the cost of business. Um, I wish I had a better answer for, for um, people who are, you know, trying to do something on their own as an entrepreneur. Um, but I did, I did want to emphasize, with as few as five, actually fewer, talking to people just the, in your environment. I mean, I'll bet every one of you knows somebody in a target market you might be considering that's a friend, a friend of a friend, a family member. I mean, simply talking to those few people and asking these types of questions can go a long way. And they'll do that for free, right? Take them out, buy them lunch, tell them what you have in mind. You'll get great information. Yes, sir. Great idea. Yeah, that's another approach for sure. And you, it's, you have to design your interview guide appropriately for five minute conversations or whatever you get, but it's an excellent approach because you can hit a lot of people and get a lot of feedback in a very short time. Thank you. Any other questions, thoughts, comments? Well, thank you very much. It's about 10.15, so I guess we're about ready to wrap it up, Stuart. Is that right? Okay, thank you.